We're about to start a unit on imaginary numbers or complex numbers. And anytime we get into this unit, students have some concerns about them. And so I wanted to try and record a video where I addressed a few of those concerns. To be clear, I'm not going to be directly answering a whole lot of questions here, uh, but more sort of making you aware of some concerns that are out there um, and some methods that you might use to try and address them. Before we get started, let's take a deep breath. And let's begin. It turns out that this entire unit of study about the complex numbers really comes out of our adding one number to the real number system. And that number is called the imaginary number, it's denoted i, and it's basically the square root of negative one. Uh, another way of thinking of it is that it's the number that when multiplied by itself gives us negative one. Um, and the introduction of a new number like that might be shocking to some of you. You've probably seen it before, but maybe when you saw it before you weren't sort of allowed to ask questions. Um, and some questions that you may be wondering are, you know, how did this number even come to be? Um, how can it exist if it's literally called the imaginary number? Like, imaginary sort of implies that something isn't real, um, and so how can something like that even exist? Um, why should we study something that can't be seen in nature? And finally, does the existence of this imaginary number mean that kind of like anybody can make up a new number and... So, I mean, does that, does that like diminish the value and the importance of numbers because it seems like you can just make them up at any time? So I'm going to attempt to give sort of quick answers to some of these things. Again, I want to be very clear that I'm not being incredibly precise or exhaustive in these answers. I just want to sort of give you some, some food for thought. Um, some of you may even consider uh, an IA or an exploration um, into some of the, the deeper understandings of imaginary numbers. Um, and so these are really just sort of uh, beginning thought points in an exploration like that. So the first question that I'll try to give a partial answer to is this idea of how and when did the imaginary number come to be. Turns out that the notation i really didn't show up until significantly later, but some of the first uh, mentions of even just the square root of a negative number come from a mathematician by the name of Cardano, who worked in the 1500s. And they sort of arose out of a, a desire or a need to solve cubic equations. So even though we first learned about this when solving quadratic equations and the quadratic formula, um, the, the need for the ability to take the square root of a negative number, or, or at least its regular mention, really came out of people trying to solve cubic equations. It would appear that the term imaginary uh, more or less uh, goes back to Descartes, a French mathematician and philosopher, um, who sort of you know noted this idea that it happens in, in mathematics and in general and, and in study and philosophy that a quantity, that something that we want to express doesn't seem to exist and, and we can't imagine it. Um, and so that may have been sort of what led to the idea of this being called the imaginary number. Um, there's a whole lot more to the history of this, but I don't want this to be super long. Um, so this is sort of just the beginnings of some of those ideas for where this may have come from. The second question we might be worried about is this idea of how can this imaginary number even exist if it isn't real? And I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is that the word real sort of has two definitions. There's, there's sort of the English word, real. And then there's the mathematical concept of the real numbers, right? And I will admit that the imaginary number is indeed not a member of the set of real numbers. But on the other hand, I, I don't see why this imaginary number can't be real in the sense that it has been developed by mathematicians. It's been shown to have properties that are of value and that it has a well-defined meaning. I think another thing that I might mention is that math has a, a rich history of things not existing for a while and then beginning to exist. Zero is not a concept that existed for a, a long period of time in the study of mathematics. Um, negative numbers are something that were sort of first developed and mentioned um, in about 200 BCE um, in Chinese mathematics. Um, the negatives were sort of more systematically introduced by an Indian mathematician, Brahmagupta, um, in about 700 of the, the current era. Um, and even up until like the 1700s, there were, there were British mathematicians, um, English mathematicians, um, who really felt like negative numbers sort of went against the, um, 
sort of like the well-orderedness of the universe and that they made things more complicated than they needed to be. At this point, I don't know that anyone really disagrees with, uh, I mean, I suppose that's not true. You, you can find people that will disagree with anything. Um, the negative numbers are certainly more more readily accepted now. Um, another thing that has that has come up in the past with mathematics is the idea of square roots of numbers. So we have lots of examples of numbers that people and mathematicians felt it didn't exist for a long period of time. And then at some point it was recognized that there was enough use for them um, and that there was a rigorous enough understanding of, of what they were and how they worked that they began to be accepted by the general mathematical community and then sort of the broader community after that. A third question that might draw some concern for you um, is this idea of why should we study something that can't be seen in nature? Um, and I think something that I might point out here is that this idea seen in nature, um, I think is the thing that I would that I would focus on here in answering this question. I think that this is often the same argument that might have been used against zero and negative five and the square root of three. Often when we say seen in nature, we're talking about counting, right? Everybody sort of comes back to like, you know, can you really have zero apples? Well, sure, you, you know, you, 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 do, you don't have any. Um, can you have negative five apples? Well, you know, I, I, can, I can owe someone an apple. Can you have the square root of three apples? And, and at some point you realize that counting isn't the only thing that we want to do with mathematics. There's a lot more that we want to do with math. And sometimes, sometimes we have to do math in an abstract space. And then the answers that we get from that abstract space end up telling us something about the real world. Um, and that ends up being the case for all of these, and it turns out it's also the case for imaginary numbers. There are many, many, many applications for imaginary numbers in the fields of engineering, in the fields of science, in the fields of mathematics. Um, and so it turns out that just because we can't clearly see these things in nature, like with our eyes, doesn't mean that they don't have impact on them. I think that the other response that I would give to this entire question is why do I care whether or not it can be seen in nature? Um, and a lot of you know that I, I really appreciate mathematics as sort of the study and, and sort of the, the pure study of mathematics. Um, I really enjoy seeing what's possible and what can be done from definitions and from axioms. So I think, you know, one of the answers that we can use is if you don't care about nature, we can study these things because they're beautiful, because they're interesting, um, because they're something that's new and exciting. Um, and if you really want application, it turns out that these do have applications. They're just, you have to get pretty deep to be able to find them. The last question I want to address, or the last concern I want to address, is, is this idea of, you know, when somebody, when, when we as mathematicians or people, when we let the imaginary number in, do we get to a slippery slope where anybody can just make up a new number? And I think the answer I want to give here is is no, but but also kind of yes. I think what I want to focus on is the word anyone. Um, not just anyone can make up a new number, and it doesn't mean that you need like a like a special mathematician badge, um, but that in order for a number to be sort of proposed and developed and used, there's a lot that needs to go into it. So you can't just walk along and say, well, I want to make a new number J. Uh, so there it is, haha, -ha. like this number exists now and now everybody has to use it. Um, in general, if you're going to propose a new number, it needs to be new. It has to do something. And if it's going to do something, it needs to interact with other numbers. There's this concept in, in mathematics called closure. Okay, and I, and I, again, I don't want to get into a ton of depth here, but there's this idea that if you're going to, have a system of numbers, whenever you take one of those numbers and add or subtract or multiply or divide or do a square root, there needs to be some, some way that that number connects with other numbers. And so maybe the question that we have here is, when I put in i, am I going to need some new system for the square root of i, or for the cube root of i, or for the fourth root of i? Or what if somebody wanted me to do 15i minus 5 over 2 minus i, and then square root it to multiply it times that? Like, do I need some other weird number for this? And it turns out, no, you don't. It turns out that introducing this one number i to our real number system still remains closed under all of the normal operations that we use.
this concept of closure is 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 big, is important, and is really studied in a field of mathematics called abstract algebra, or even even just algebra, which is more than just math that you learned in like seventh or eighth or maybe ninth grade. Um, it's this entire field of mathematics that really goes into the underpinnings of all of that. Uh, it's one of my favorite areas of mathematics. Um, and so that's where you would learn more about this concept of closure. The final thing that I'll say is, is you know, yeah, there are other new numbers. Um, there's a type of numbers called the quaternions, which I'm, I'm definitely not going to get into now, both because of time and because I don't know a whole lot about them. Um, but the quaternions were really something that sort of came out of the study of I, that there may be a deeper understanding to this. Now again, I know that this video has not been exhaustive in providing complete answers to all of these questions, um, but I wanted to make it clear that there are a lot of really great connections to, to the theory of knowledge um, and to mathematics and to the way that we think about math. Um, and I want to let you know it's okay to ask those questions. So if you have those questions, please feel free to ask them of me. I'll do my best to give answers. Um, and I would also encourage you to, to go out and do research on your own. Look into this. There's some really, really exciting stuff that's out there. Um, and I feel like this complex numbers chapter is the first place that we really get to see it and, and get to explore it. So I hope that you're even half as excited for this next unit as I am. Um, and I look forward to studying it with you.